Hello students, let us see what the ENT questions in the NEET 2023 paper were. So we could recall a total of around seven questions from ENT, out of which two were from here, one from nose, one from pharynx, and three from larynx. So let us quickly see what these questions were. So starting with the first question, a 10-year-old child has throat pain, fever, and ear pain. He is diagnosed with acute tonsillitis. Which nerve is involved in causing the ear pain in this child? So what is being asked is, what is the nerve that carries referred pain from the tonsil to the ear? So yes, tonsil is supplied by, yes, the glossopharyngeal nerve. So referred pain to the ear will be through the tympanic branch of glossopharyngeal. And can you tell me the name of that? Yes, that is the Jacobson's nerve. So let us see if that is there in the choice or not. Yes, we have that as the first choice, tympanic branch of glossopharyngeal nerve. Yes, so can you tell me if this child has pain in the ear, exactly which part of the ear will the child be feeling the pain? In the pinna or deep inside? Yes, the glossopharyngeal supplies which part of the ear? The middle ear. So the pain will be in the deep in the ear, in the middle ear area. Okay, now can there be pain in the ear, referred pain through the mandibular nerve? Yes or no? Does any branch of mandibular supply the ear? Yes, we have the auricular temporal nerve. So yes, it can cause referred pain to the ear. So now you will tell me that if there is referred pain uh, through the mandibular nerve, it is bringing pain from which area and to which part of the ear exactly? Yes, all these questions that are asked from the referred otalgia are very, very important and they have been repeatedly asked in the past and they will be asked in the future also. So yes, if there is any referred pain from the auriculotemporal nerve, it will come from which area? So auriculotemporal nerve supplies this area. So here the pain can occur from the TM joint can be brought to the ear from the TM joint, from the dental conditions, from the entire two-third of the tongue. And it will be referred exactly to which part of the ear? Yes, it will go to the is this adjacent part of the pinna, that is the tragus, the anterior part of the helix. It will also go to the external aortic canal and also the tympanic membrane. So recently has been a question again that carcinoma base of tongue, pain is referred to the ear through which nerve? So if it is base of tongue, then the answer becomes glossopharyngeal. Where it, whereas if it is carcinoma anterior two third of the tongue, then it will be taken to the ear through through the auriculotemporal or the lingual or the mandibular, whatever is given in the choice. Yes, again was a recent question asked that tragus is supplied by which nerve? So tragus, we know it is very adjacent to the auriculotemporal nerve. It is supplied by the auriculotemporal nerve. So the third choice we have is greater auricular nerve. Can there be referred pain in the ear because of greater auricular nerve? Yes, the greater auricular nerve can lead to referred pain in the ear. So you will tell me now it will bring pain from which area and exactly to which part of the ear. Yes, so the greater auricular we know is a branch of cervical plexus C2, C3. From the cervical plexus it goes to supply the angle of jaw. Yes, this has been again a repeated question that angle of jaw, the angle of mandible is supplied by which nerve. Yes, why this is asked? Because you usually confuse that this is the auricular temporal which supplies the angle of jaw also. No. Auriculotemporal supplies this lower part of the mandible except for the angle of jaw. So the angle of jaw is or the angle of mandible is supplied by the greater auricular. So not only it supplies the angle of mandible, it also goes, what is the structure here? The parotid. So it also goes deep in the parotid sub to supply the uh, deep, the investing layer of the deep cervical fascia which forms the parotid fascia. So it also supplies the parotid fascia and then it comes to supply the major part of the pinna, all this part that you are seeing. In the pinna, the lateral surface as well as most of the medial surface of the pinna is supplied by the greater auricular nerve. So pain can occur through the greater auricular nerve from which areas? Yes, from cervical spine conditions, also from parotid infections. So parotid infections can lead to referred pain in the ear through two nerves, through auricular temporal also and also through the greater auricular which supplies the parotid fascia. And it will be referred to which part of the ear? To most of the pinna. Also to the external artery canal, also to the tympanic membrane? No, only to the pinna, the major part of the lateral as well as the medial surface of the pinna. So the last choice we have here is auricular branch of vagus. Auricular branch of vagus, can you tell me it is known as what? Yes, it is known as Arnold's or Alderman's nerve. Can it lead to referred pain in the ear? Yes. From which area? To exactly which part of the ear? From which area? Yes, from the larynx, from the hypopharynx, from the thyroid and exactly to which part of the ear? Yes, it can go to... The pinna, yes or no? Yes, the concha, this part is supplied by the vagus. Also to the external aortic canal and also to the tympanic membrane. So all these points we need to know. Now, if I ask you that during parotid surgery, there is injury to some nerve following which patient presents with 
numbness in the shaving area or numbness in the lobule which nerve has got injured so during parotid surgery yes this has been a recent question again so during parotid surgery what is the incision given the incision that is given is something like this yes so when we give this incision very commonly is injured the greater auricular which is coming like this yes so the greater auricular lies just very superficial below the skin it gets injured and following this there can be anesthesia in the shaving area numbness in the shaving area so yes i have just made a tabulated form of the summary of the nerve supply all the points that you should know you should be knowing in the nerve supply and the rheumatology so yes uh, through the auricular temporal nerve there can be pain in the ear from which areas from the tm joint dental conditions parotid infections and tumors and near to the tongue exactly going to which part of the ear to the pinnacle sternal canal as well as the tympanic membrane from the glossopharyngeal tympanic branch that is the Jacob's nerve pain can come from the oropharynx that is the tonsil the base of tongue and it can come to which part of the ear the middle ear from the vagus that is the arnold the alderman's nerve pain can come from the larynx pain can come from the hypopharynx the thyroid and can come to which part of the ear yes a lot of the part of the ear the pinna external artery canal as well as tympanic membrane and again there has been a very common question that has been asked repeatedly here that is while cleaning the ear or while syringing a patient usually coughs this is because of which nerve Yes, this is because of the same nerve that supplies the larynx and the ear, and that is the vagus, the Arnold's or the Alderman's nerve. Now, through the greater auricular, when there is rheumatology, it can come from the cervical conditions or from the parotid also, and it can come to which part of the ear? The most of the pinna. And yes, we have another important something to do with the sensory nerve supply, not with the rheumatology specifically, but yes, and that is the sensory part of the facial supplying the posterior superior part of external acoustic meatus, getting involved in acoustic neuroma, leading to hyperesthesia or anesthesia in this part, and that is again a very commonly asked sign. This is known as the Hitzelberger sign. So all these are the points which we cannot simply afford to forget. So starting with the next question. A female patient is examined and is found to be Rini's negative at 256 hertz and 512 hertz, while Rini's is positive at 1024 hertz. What is the expected airborne gap? Now, when we want to find out the airborne gap, that is the the degree of hearing loss, do we use tuning for for that? We use a better test that is the Puritan audiometry and that will exactly tell us which frequency how much is the hearing loss but yes when Puritan audiometry was not that tuning forks used to be used as a rough guide to find out how much is the hearing loss and again different books mention different values for this so what is the most accepted and the safest for you to remember that is what I am going to tell you so here what we first need to know is that Rini's is negative in which condition? Rini's negative is either in conductive hearing loss or is in severe sensorineural hearing loss. Now here what is asked is the AB gap. AB gap signifies conductive hearing loss. So what is asked here is conductive hearing loss. Okay, so now here if Rini's is negative at 256 hertz, what you have to remember is that there is a minimum AB gap of around 15 to 20 decibel or you can just remember it as 15 decibel okay so which means that if the Rini's is negative at 256 hertz patient has a minimum conductive hearing loss of around 15 decibel if the Rini's is negative at 512 hertz patient has a minimum conductive hearing loss of around 30 decibel and if the Rini's is negative at 1024 hertz, then the patient has a minimum conductive hearing loss of around 45 decibel. Is that clear? We also know that has been a question asked earlier that Rini's becomes negative at how much hearing loss, as at how much conductive hearing loss, when the minimum conductive hearing loss is how much only then the Rini's turns negative? Yes, 15 to 20 decibel. So that is the 256 hertz. So what we have seen here is that if the Rini's is negative at 256 hertz, patient has a minimum he conductive hearing loss of 15 decibel. At 512 hertz, minimum conductive hearing loss of 30 decibel. And 1024 hertz, uh, there is a minimum conductive hearing loss of 45 decibel. So you can just remember that there is a gap of 15 decibel in each, right? Now in this question, what is given is that the Rini's is negative at 256 as well as 512 hertz. 256 means minimum. 20, 15 decibel he has hearing loss 512 means minimum 30 decibel hearing loss he has right so this patient has uh, rini is negative at 512 so minimum 30 decibel of hearing loss he has and it the rini is positive at 1024 
means the 45 decibel sound the patient is able to hear, which means the hearing loss is in between 30 to 45 decibel, right? So 30 to 45 decibel. So the answer here will be 30 to 45 decibel. So let me write this down for you. 256 hertz, 512 and 1024 and approximate how much AB gap or how much conductive hearing loss the patient has, right? So, and all these questions you are going to answer for me now that I have told you already what, how much hearing loss in each frequency is there, yes? So if the release is negative at 256 hertz, whereas it is positive at 512 and 1024, tell me the minimum AB gap or minimum conductive hearing loss this patient has. 256 negative means minimum 15 decibel hearing loss he has. 512 positive means that 30 decibel sound the patient is able to hear. Yes. So in this patient, the AB gap or conductive hearing loss is around 15 to 30 decibel. Right. Okay. Now, if the release is negative at 256 as well as for 512 and positive at 1024, means the patient has a minimum hearing loss at of around 30 decibel 512 is also negative means minimum 30 decibel hearing loss conductive hearing loss he has 1024 he is able to hear means 45 decibel sound he is able to hear so here the hearing loss is 30 to 45 decibel and if the release is negative at 256 512 as well as 1024 now how much will be the approximate hearing loss yes 256 means at least 15 decibel 512 at least 30 decibel and 104 Two, four means at least 45 decibel. So this patient has at least 45 decibel conductive hearing loss and conductive hearing loss can never be more than 60 decibel, right? So this patient has an approximate conductive hearing loss of 45 to 60 decibel, right? And what if the release is positive at 256 at 512 as well as at 1024, then yes, it means even a 15 decibel sound the patient is able to hear. So the hearing is, hearing is normal. Is that clear? So what you have to essentially remember here is that a 256 hertz negative indicates at least a 15 decibel conductive hearing loss. 512 negative indicates at least a 30 decibel conductive hearing loss and 1024 negative indicates at least a 45 decibel hearing loss. Starting with the next question, a 30 year old male presents with non axial proptosis of the right eye. The patient gives a history of road traffic accident 15 years back. The CT MRI image is as given below. What is the likely diagnosis? So, were both the CT and the MRI image given? So, there are a lot of discrepancies in a lot of things in this question that different students have provided us. The age was different as per different students. Some said that there was a CT image given and they provided us with this image. Some said it was an MRI image and they provided us with this image, okay. So now at least what we are able to make out is that this is a patient in the CT or the MRI. What is being seen is here is the frontal sinus. We are seeing the frontal sinus with the scalloped margins, the irregular frontal sinus and here is air in the other one. Here we are seeing that there is some collection, right. And same in the MRI image also what we are seeing is the frontal sinus of this side, the other side contains air and here again we are seeing some collection or some mass and that is compressing on the orbit also that we can make out. Now what all the students were sure of in this question was non-axial proptosis, history of injury and also the CT or the MRI image showing some mass in the frontal sinus, some collection or mass in the frontal sinus area, okay. So let us see with this much knowledge which we are sure of we can come to the diagnosis or not. So we had non-axial proptosis, axial proptosis, we had injury, history of injury some years back and we had the CT or MRI image showing collection or mass in the, in the frontal sinus area. Frontal sinus area, which was compressing on the orbit. Some said, yes, there was some erosion of the orbital wall also. But yes, it was uh, more of arising from the frontal sinus area, right? Now, the first thing is, what is the meaning of non-axial proptosis? Yes, this you must have read in detail in Okta. What is axial proptosis? Axial proptosis means that the orbit or the globe is pushed anteriorly. The proptosis is because of pushing of the orbit anteriorly and this occurs whenever the lesion is confined to the cone of the orbit. What is the cone of the orbit? Yes, the muscle cone of the orbit. So this here, what we are seeing, 
is the muscle cone of the orbit. So when the lesion is inside the muscle cone, intraconal, then it pushes the orbit anteriorly leading to proptosis. That is what is known as axial proptosis. Whereas what's the meaning of non-axial proptosis? Non-axial proptosis means that the orbit is pushed forward, but it is eccentrically located. That occurs because of any extraconal lesion, which means that the the lesion is outside the cone of the, the muscle cone of the orbit, which means it is because of involvement of structures around the orbit. For example, any involvement of frontal or the ethmoid sinuses, any mass here, or of the lacrimal gland or of the maxillary sinuses, they can push the orbit leading to proptosis, but that will be a non axial and eccentric pushing of the orbit, either laterally or medially. Yes. So, with this much knowledge, let us see whether we are able to come to the diagnosis. The first choice that we have here is frontal mucosine. Now, what is frontal mucosine? Yes, that is collection of mucoid secretions in the frontal sinus. Why has it collected? Because the drainage is not able to happen, which means that whenever there is obstruction of the drainage of the frontal sinus, the drainage of frontal sinus occurs through the frontal nasal duct, which nowadays we call as frontal recess. Yes, it drains into the middle meatus. So, whenever this duct or this recess is obstructed, this can lead to collection of mucoid secretions in the frontal sinus. So what can be the cause of this obstruction? It can be an anatomical, anatomical obstruction because of any stenosis that has occurred following injury or this injury can also be iatrogenic or it can be non-iatrogenic. Iatrogenic as in following press, non-iatrogenic as in any injury on this on the nose or on their frontal sinuses or it can occur because of any mass compressing it from outside the drainage duct compressing it from outside for example it can be any osteomas or any tumors in this area this obstruction of the drainage can also occur because of inflammatory edema which can occur following allergies or it can be a chronic complication of uh, sinusitis yes so non can it lead to non axial proptosis yes whenever there is any mass or tumor or any enlargement of the frontal sinus area or the ethmoid it can lead to proptosis and that will be non-axial. So yes, in frontal mucosil, in frontal mucosil, there can be non-axial proptosis. Does it follow injury? Yes, it follows injury. And in the CT or MRI, do we see a mass in this area? Yes, we do see a mass in this area, right? Now in frontal meningioma, this is mucosil, right? Mucosil. Now, in frontal meningioma, will there be non-axial proptosis? What do we mean by meningioma? Frontal meningioma. Frontal meningioma. Meningioma means a tumor that is arising from the meninges, and frontal means it is arising from meninges of which area? Of the frontal lobe. This does not mean a frontal sinus meningioma. The frontal sinus or the paranasal sinus meningioma is extremely rare, and if they occur, they are primarily arise from the meninges and then they extend to the sinuses. So, which means that patients of frontal meningioma presenting with proptosis, can you imagine such a huge mass it will be if it is presenting with proptosis. So, it is highly unlikely and secondly, if at all let us assume that it has become so large that it is leading to proptosis, will there be not other features which are because of involvement of the frontal lobe? For example, personality changes, behavioral changes, Yes, so it is highly unlikely that it will lead to non axial proptosis. Injury, meningiomas don't follow injuries. So no, this is also not. And will there be a lesion here in the frontal sinus area? Highly unlikely. Juvenile nasal nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. Okay, can it lead to proptosis which is non axial? Yes, it can lead to proptosis which is non axial. It can lead to. Does it follow injury? Angiofibroma? No. It does not follow injury and will it ever show a mass in the frontal sinus area? We know that we exactly are not sure what the CT was or whatever the CT or the MRI was, it was showing some mass in the frontal sinus area. So that cannot be angiofibroma. This is how a CT of angiofibroma will appear like. It arises from the sphenopalatine foramen area and then when it grows laterally, it goes into the sphenopalatine fossa. When it has filled the fossa, it grows superiorly through the intraorbital fissure. It goes to the orbit and there it can lead to proptosis and then later on it goes further laterally into the infratemporal fossa it can present a swelling of the cheek now even when it has gone to the orbit to lead to proptosis it means that it is a huge tumor will this patient not have epistaxis yes so this is totally a no-no for angiofibroma right and orbital pseudotumor what is orbital pseudotumor it is an inflammatory lesion arising 
inside the cone muscle cone of the orbit so this will lead to proptosis which is axial so this exactly is the ct of uh, orbital pseudo tumor so it will lead to an axial proptosis so no not non axial and also there is no history of injury present here and so this is a total no no so what is the answer here yes so seeing the yes only from these three things we could make out that clearly the answer is frontal muco c is that clear so whenever there is any question where you feel that by seeing the ct or the mri you are actually not getting to know don't panic be calm with what you are sure of just try to approach that question with those things that i'm sure you will come be able to come to the answer so the next question we have here is identify the structure marked in the image so let us see what the image is yes so this is an image of the nasopharynx and what do you think is the structure that is marked yes clearly it is the fossa of rosenmuller now some students told me that we were not sure whether it was the station tube opening or the fossa of rosenmuller why at all do you have to get confused whether it is the station tube or the fossa of rosenmuller what you have to remember is that when we see the nasopharynx the lateral of the nasopharynx what are the structures in order from anterior to posterior the anterior most is the eustachian tube opening right we know that the anterior most is the eustachian tube behind that is the torus tubaris that is the bulge of the eustachian tube cartilage behind that is the fossa of rosenmuller right now even if the picture that was given to you was not a very good picture assume that something like this was given and this was the mark structure will you get confused whether it's the eustachian tube or the fossa of rosenmuller yeah you don't have to see the depth some students told me that the depth was more depth was less and that was making us confused i mean you don't have to see the depth that does not matter what you have to see is whether it is anteriorly located or posteriorly located so when you are seeing the lateral wall of the nasopharynx the anterior most opening that will be the this this what we are seeing what is marked is anterior most so this is going to be the station tube behind that this bulge is the torus tuberis and behind that will be the fossa of frozen muller and here in the posterior pharyngeal wall this will be the area of the adenoid is that clear so what is the answer here yes so the answer here is clearly fossa of frozen muller fossa of frozen muller so coming to the next question a one year child presents with noisy breathing on examination there is biphasic strider the x ray ap view is given below most likely diagnosis is so let us see the x ray Yes, yeah, so the X-ray clearly is showing the very typical sign, the pencil tip sign, also known as the steeple sign, and this is characteristic of laryngotracheobronchitis. That is croup, right? So yes, what the answer here is laryngotracheobronchitis. Now suppose the X-ray was not given, and only this history was given. Can we still come to the diagnosis with the help of history? Let us see. Yes, yeah, so biphasic strider tells you that the lesion is. Either subglottic or cervical trachea, and rarely it can also be in glottic conditions. Now, here, laryngomalacia, the first choice, laryngomalacia is a supraglottic condition. So, there the strider will be inspiratory. So, this cannot be the answer. Laryngotracheobronchitis, yes, subglottic condition. This can be the answer. Foreign body subglottis also will lead to biphasic strider, but there you will see the foreign body in the x ray, right? and epiglottitis epiglottitis is a supraglottic condition there again the strider is going to be inspiratory so this also cannot be the answer so coming to the next question a 55 year old patient comes with hoarseness of voice difficulty in swallowing and difficulty in breathing the patient was diagnosed with cancer and surgical management was done post operative picture is as given below which of the following surgery was done on the patient so here we have a patient with hoarseness with difficulty in breathing and swallowing all of which localized the lesion to be in the larynx yes and the patient is diagnosed as cancer so it is cancer of the larynx surgical management was done and post operative picture is given so let us see what the post op picture was yes so can you see this picture and tell me what this picture is showing tell me in one word one word for what this is showing yes this is showing a permanent tracheostome uh, and recently had been again a question a question that was asked that what is the meaning of permanent tracheostome what is a permanent tracheostome and there were four choices given so what is permanent tracheostome permanent tracheostome means that we have 
pulled out the trachea and we have sutured it to the skin outside. So, which means this patient is not going to breathe through the nose and through the larynx and then through the trachea. This patient is directly going to breathe through the trachea, through this new opening, new channel that you have made. When will you make a permanent tracheostome? When will you pull out the trachea and suture it to the skin outside? Yes, when the larynx has been completely removed. So, which means that the surgery that has been done for this patient is a total laryngectomy. Why not partial laryngectomy? Now, in partial laryngectomy, we are removing the larynx partially, which means we are preserving the larynx. Why are we preserving the larynx? To preserve the respiratory pathway and to preserve the voice. Now, if you are preserving the larynx for that, does it make any sense that you separate the larynx from the trachea and take the trachea out and suture to the skin outside? No. The purpose of preserving the larynx has then been lost. So, no, this is not a partial laryngectomy. Standard tracheostomy and percutaneous tracheostomy. Now, the post-operative picture of a standard tracheostomy or a percutaneous tracheostomy appears like this. Once you have done a tracheostomy, this is how the post-operative picture, either this or this, this is how the post-operative picture appears like. The only difference between standard tracheostomy and percutaneous tracheostomy is how you do the tracheostomy. In standard tracheostomy, you go for the open approach where you give the incision on the neck, you retract the strap muscles, reach the trachea, give the incision on the trachea, put the tracheostomy tube. Whereas in percutaneous tracheostomy, this is a simpler way to do tracheostomy, which even the doctors who are not surgeons can do it. So what is done in percutaneous tracheostomy is that a needle which is attached to a cannula, which in turn is attached to a syringe, is passed through the skin of the neck into the trachea. Now, once you feel that it has reached the trachea, you uh, just uh, pull the syringe and you can see air bubbles entering into the, the saline which is there in the syringe. Now, once you're sure of that, you remove the syringe and you pass a guide wire through the cannula. So, a guide wire is passed through the cannula into the trachea. Now, once it reaches the trachea, now you remove the cannula and over the guide wire, you pass the dilators starting from a low size to a subsequently higher size till the size of the opening in the neck big, big, becomes big enough that you can pass a tracheostomy tube. So, this can be done even by doctors who are not surgeons. So, the only difference is the approach to the trachea, but whether it is a standard tracheostomy or a percutaneous tracheostomy, post-operative picture appears either li like this or it appears like this. So, clearly the answer to this question is total laryngectomy. So, this was a question that was asked, yes, maybe last year or last to last year. The picture was given and was asked that what is the mode of rehabilitation of speech that this patient is using. So, this picture itself tells you that a total injectomy has been done for the patient and this patient is using some mode of rehabilitation of speech. So, yes, what we can see here is some processes that has been put on the posterior wall of the trachea. So, yes, this is the tracheoesophageal processes and this is the best method of rehabilitation of speech following uh, total laryngectomy. So, coming to the next question, the instrument shown in the image is not used for. Let us see what this instrument is. So, yes, this is the tracheostomy tube. So, what is being asked here is that tracheostomy tube is not used for. So, not an indication of tracheostomy. So, let us see the choices. Upper airway obstruction. Is tracheostomy done in upper airway obstruction? Yes or no? Yes, whenever the obstruction is above the level where you are doing, we are doing tracheostomy, that is an indication of tracheostomy to bypass that obstruction. Now, many a times I used to see calls where it was mentioned in the call that this is a patient of respiratory distress following bronchogenic carcinoma. Kindly come and do tracheostomy for this patient. So, will a tracheostomy help in bronchogenic carcinoma? The site of obstruction is below where you are doing tracheostomy. Will that help? No. So, it has to be above the level of where you are doing tracheostomy to bypass that obstruction. So, it has to be upper airway obstruction. So, in upper airway obstruction, you go for tracheostomy. So, that is not an indication. No. So, upper airway assessment. For upper airway assessment, do we need a tracheostomy? It can be done so easily with the help of endoscopes. So, upper airway assessment, no, we don't need tracheostomy. Lung toileting, do we need tracheostomy? Yes, for lung toileting, that is removing the secretions from the lungs. Suppose here is a patient who is on prolonged ventilatory support, yes, and you need to constantly clear the secretions from the chest. 
will you prefer an endotracheal that is a naso or the nasotracheal or the orotracheal tube or a tracheostomy in this patient to regularly you have to repeatedly regularly suction on the secretions from the lung what will you prefer obviously a tracheostomy to suction on secretions from the chest from the lungs it is much easier with tracheostomy also if at all the tube gets blocked because of so much of secretions it is much easier to handle and replace a tracheostomy tube rather than a orotracheal or a nasotracheal tube so for lung toileting it is always preferable to go for a tracheostomy in maxillofacial injuries do we go for tracheostomy yes whenever there is injuries in the maxillofacial area or where there when there are cervical spine injuries or in laryngeal injuries where we cannot go for a orotracheal intubation we always prefer to we always go for a tracheostomy not even prefer we have to go for a tracheostomy again when we are doing major surgeries of the oral cavity oropharynx larynx as in carcinomas of these areas where we have to do a lot of surgery in that area we always do a elective tracheostomy before the surgery before starting with operating that tumor we always go for elective tracheostomy for this patient so that we can give ventilation through the tracheostomy we never put a orotracheal or a naso nasotracheal tube in this patient because this is going to come in the way of the area where we are going to operate in the area of the surgery so we might just put a nick on the uh, endotracheal tube or we might just displace it while operating in that area so it is always safer and very nice to go for a tracheostomy for these patients so in maxillofacial surgeries or in maxillofacial injuries or in head and neck surgeries head and neck injuries eh, we always go for tracheostomy so what is the answer what is not an indication yes the upper airway assessment that is the answer so this will be the answer so having a quick look at the indications of tracheostomy so the indications of tracheostomy you can remember by the simple mnemonic that all the students who know how to do tracheostomy should occupy most seats in medical association occupy is obstruction obstruction whatever the cause may be infection tumor trauma foreign body vocal cord palsy but it has to be above the level of where you are doing the tracheostomy m is mechanical ventilation prolonged mechanical ventilation whenever you have to give then b uh, prefer tracheostomy because lung toileting is very easy in in tracheostomy tracheostomized patients now also very important thing that you should know here is that in children who have to be on prolonged mechanical ventilation for a very long time we always prefer going for tracheostomy because the endotracheal tube cuff lies at the level of subglottis and if this child is going to be on mechanical ventilation on uh, ventilatory support for a very long time this cuff of the tube is going to put pressure on the subglottic area that is on the cricoid which is a complete ring cartilage and constant pressure on this area will lead to necrosis ultimately fibrosis resulting in stenosis that is a subglottic stenosis so to avoid that these children the children who have been who have to be on mechanical ventilation for prolonged duration are shifted to tracheostomy because the tracheostomy tube cuff will lie lower down in the trachea and tracheal rings we know are c shaped they are not complete ring so the chance of stenosis in the trachea is very very less as compared to subglottic stenosis so that is again a very important thing that you should know and uh, s is the, to remove the secretions the respiratory secretions m is maxillofacial and head neck surgery that we have already discussed and a is prevention of aspiration as in bilateral complete vocal cord palsy out of these the most common indication of elective tracheostomy is prolonged mechanical ventilation so these are the important things that you need to know in the indications of tracheostomy so those were the questions from ent and i am sure that you were able to answer all of them so always remember that you know most of the things all you need to do is be calm during the exam and try to find out the answer with what you know rather than panicking about the things which you do not know